Download, where we make sense of all things Catholic, coming to you live from Church Milton Studios here in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Blessed Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and also it's a holy day of obligation, so be sure to get yourself to Mass in honor of our Blessed Mother. We're discussing the Protestant Formed Alpha program, a program that's turning Catholics into Protestants and doing so in several ways. Today, Simon will look at Alpha's push for private interpretation of Scripture. Stephen will focus on Alpha's steering people away from the teaching magisterium of the church. And Christine will highlight Alpha's advance of the uh, avoidance of the sacraments and uh, Eucharist. So, Simon, private interpretation. Uh, it's something on Nicky Gumbel's lips and his cohorts uh, almost every day. It is, yeah. It's, it's, it's really, if there was one thing that you could sum up Alpha as opposed to um, use of like not very good locations in London to shoot all the stuff in, the focus would be on private interpretation of Scripture. This is the focus. Now, here's the problem with private interpretation of Scripture. It's a really bad idea, and it's not the way Scripture should be interpreted. Let's actually look at some things that happen in Scripture themselves to look at this. The first is, let's look at the letters of St. Peter. In there, St. Peter, the first pope, he says, um, he's talking about the letters of St. Paul, and he says that many unstable individuals twist these letters to, for, for their own ends. Now, bear in mind, he's right Writing this while St. Paul is still alive. St. Peter and St. Paul died, you know, round about the same time. Some people, some traditions have them dying actually on the same day. Um, the, the ink is still wet on St. Peter's letters at this point, and he, uh, St. Paul's letters, and he's saying, St. Peter, there's, there's this misinterpretation that uh, deranged and unstable individuals do. Also, uh, another saint, uh, St. Philip, he meets with the Ethiopian eunuch, and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading the scriptures, and St. Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, no, how can I understand if somebody doesn't tell me? So what we actually have there is within scriptures itself some very clear things. Uh, you know, I haven't even quoted St. Peter's interpretation of scripture is not a matter of private interpretation because that would just be kind of too obvious but we have within scripture itself instructions to say that private interpretation is bad that is not what Nicky Gumbel and his cohorts say so let's take a look and roll tape how can you hold together the inspiration of scripture and the difficult stuff that we come across in the bible some of these contradictions can be overcome by understanding the type of literature that you're reading and the context that it was written in. And Jesus is the key to interpreting what we read. Jesus is love. He's the supreme revelation of God. If we want to know what God is like, he is like Jesus. And what I've found is that the more you trust that the Bible is inspired by God, the more you understand. Okay, there is just so much wrong with that on so many levels. The key is not simply Jesus. What we have is we have this ridiculous, sappy, hallmark card, most hallmark would throw it out for being bad. <laughs> it's this ridiculous, sappy emotionalism. Jesus is love, love is Jesus, and, that, and you never actually discuss, can we define Jesus? Can we define God? Can we define love? What does it mean? Saying one thing is another, you know what that is? It's, it's, it's a metaphor, it's useful in poetry, it's not useful in theology unless you understand what one of the things is. And they've got a completely flawed idea of love because this notion of saying, provided you love Jesus, scripture will interpret itself accurately for you. Well, what you're doing, if you get half a dozen different Protestant dominations, they've each got a different interpretation about, you know, a bunch of different scriptures. They all say they love Jesus. At least all but one of them is lying about loving Jesus. Uh, but really, are they? I mean, are they, are these people, are they genuinely of goodwill? They're genuinely sincere. They, they want to love Jesus. They try to orient their lives around it. But what they lack is they lack the magisterium, they lack the authority of the church to give that non-private interpretation of scripture, that corporate interpretation of scripture, that interpretation of scripture that was handed on to us from Jesus himself through the apostles. Yeah, you get uh, with the Ethiopian, was he in bad faith? Did he not have enough warm, fuzzy feeling yeah. inside of him to... Uh, he but, clearly had enough intellect to say, well, I'm reading this thing, and I don't know what it means unless someone can tell me. I, I would say you he know. had enough humility. He had enough humility to, to that, you know. That. So, Nicky Gumbel is not really pro-magisterium then, uh, leading people to... Uh, no, no, you don't hear him uh, talk a lot about that, actually. It's uh, Sola Scriptura all the way, as the uh, following clip will illustrate. Let's take a look at that. The primary way in which God communicates with us is through the Bible. 
It's his revelation. But how do we know about Jesus? The main way we know is through the Bible. The New Testament is obviously about Jesus. But the Old Testament also, once you begin to look at it through the lens of Jesus, you see that too is all about a person, the person of Jesus. So science is the exploration of the way in which God has revealed himself through creation. That's why science is so important. It's so amazing. It's so exciting. And theology is an exploration of how God has revealed himself in Jesus and in the Bible. Wrong. Uh, <laughs> basically, uh, the, okay, well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there we go. Christine, <laughs> to you. Um, no, really, the, the, the primary way God communicates with us is through his church. Uh, you know, the, the, the church understands we, it does not derive its certainty um, about revealed truths just through the Holy Scriptures, but also through sacred tradition. Uh, the, the Catechism, for example, it teaches tradition transmits in its entirety the Word of God, which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ. Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And these truths are clarified through the magisterium. Again, he, he may, makes no mention of that whatsoever. Um, uh, and, and for this reason, you can get, you know, the, the, the question of private interpretation comes up. You can get a thousand different uh, interpretations from a, uh, about a particular passage. Um, I'd like to quote, if I could, from uh, De Verbum, the uh, Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, signed by Blessed Pope Paul VI. He lays it out uh, uh, succinctly, very well, I think. He says, sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the teaching authority of the church, the magisterium, are so linked and joined together that one cannot stand without the others. And that all together and each in its own way, under the action of the one Holy Spirit, contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. Therefore, both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of loyalty and reverence. So by completely disregarding the magisterium, tradition, uh, because they're so linked, uh, uh, Nick Ingebel is actually really undermining sacred scripture as well. It's just uh, thumbs down again from me uh, uh, here on Friday. So uh, Nicky Gumbel is not really advocating uh, turning to the church for truth, but at least he's advocating turning to the church for sanctification, the sacraments, uh, becoming holier that way. No? If people have been watching our series on Alpha the past four days and they still don't understand why you shouldn't use it in a Catholic context, then I don't even know what to say anymore. All I can say is you need to study and learn your faith. That includes bishops and priests. Um, yeah, we have another clip here of Alpha talking about scripture. So let's go ahead and listen to this clip. At the end of John's Gospel it says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. So the best way to invest in this relationship and to hear from God and to know Jesus is through reading the Bible. Wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> that flatly contradicts the Catholic faith. He said, the best way to know Jesus is through reading the Bible. No, it is not. That's not Catholic. The best way to know Jesus is through his church and most especially through his sacraments and most especially through the Holy Eucharist. That is the source and summit of our Catholic faith. The source, the summit, everything. It is the most intimate communion we can possibly have with God on this side of heaven. That is how we get to know our Lord, the best way. The Bible is obviously one of them. That's one of the divinely revealed truths, but that's not the best way. This is error, and this is being promoted to Catholics. And as a source of evangelization, why are you promoting error to Catholics? Again, I've asked this question every single day that we've been doing the show. Why are priests pushing this when it has clear error? Do they not recognize or do they not care about their flock getting the truth? Or do you really think it's okay to lay a faulty, erroneous foundation just to sort of go back and then have to, have to undo that? What is the purpose of that? It's ridiculous. Okay, we have another clip here. Let's go ahead and roll that. And don't worry if you come across difficulties or bits that you don't really understand. I found it's a bit like a crossword puzzle. You start with a clue and sometimes you come across one that you can't really answer. But you don't stop. You move on to the next clue and maybe that's a bit easier and then you start to fill in a few of the clues. And that gives you the letters that help you to understand the more difficult ones. And I found it's a bit like that with the Bible. 
I wrestle with all this stuff, and the more I wrestle with it, the more I begin to understand other bits that I'm reading. And if you expect God to speak to you through the Bible, then He will. It's exciting to know God and to communicate with Him in that way. Wrong! <laughs> this is pushing personal interpretation of Scripture. And he's talking about, oh, well, you know, if you find a difficult passage, well, you know, it's kind of like a clue, and then you find another clue, and then another clue, and you just sort of put it together like a puzzle, and then you just, you know, keep asking God, and then you sort of, he communicates to you. No, that is not how Catholics approach Scripture. We have a magisterium to authentically and authoritatively interpret Scripture for us so that we don't have to be confused and put it together like some sort of crossword puzzle ourselves. That's how Protestants do it. It's called personal interpretation. It is heresy, it is wrong. The way Catholics do it, which is the proper way, is through the magisterium, which has been given the authority by our Lord Jesus Christ to speak in his name, to authoritatively interpret scripture, and to teach truth. It is a reliable guide of truth, so that when we have difficulties in understanding scripture, we don't have to reinvent the wheel the way Protestants do. We have an objective guide, safeguarded from error by the Holy Spirit. It's the magisterium. Again, Alpha is pushing error. And any Catholic watching this, you cannot in good faith promote this in your parish, or lead it, or anything. It's, it, it's, it's beyond ridiculous. Well, you know, we... we Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> the idea, even, even if someone just picks it up and they're able to reinvent the wheel, rebuild mathematics from the ground up, rebuild any scientific field from the ground up, rebuild anything that adds truth, how to fix, make cars, you already build on a body of knowledge. If this, all of this private interpretation stuff actually even worked, in the early days of the church, or if it worked now, would not it have worked in the early days of the church? We have a thing called the fathers of the church. Mm -hmm. Holy people reading the Bible within the church's construct of which, within how it was actually preached and taught and, and, and read and heard and, you know, talking with St. Peter, talking with St. Paul, what do you mean by saying this? How do you mean that? And their disciples and their disciples, that was the fathers of the church. The magisterium, when they're trying to figure out something in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 8th century, they go back to the fathers of the church, they go back to the uh, original sources. So we have 2,000 years of building on that, and truth doesn't contradict truth. If we already discerned, you know, from our gnosis, that 2 plus 2 somehow equals 4, and we really are sure of that, the next century that works on mathematics doesn't have to go back and discern all that over again. Why do we have to go through this conundrum, even if it was a valid way of doing it, of reinventing the wheel every single century? Well, I think, I think there, are, there are sort of two points to be made there. The first one is that they're not interested in reinventing the wheel. Instead, what they are interested in is they're interested in building a scaffolding to support a pre-existing concept. Mm -hmm. And that's a very key point. If you give somebody the Bible and you say, I want you to read this Bible and I want you to interpret what you know, any given passage means, they will tend to interpret the passage so that it conforms to their morality. It's yeah, like a favorite game yeah. that I've played with um, uh, liberal Catholics or liberal Protestants, essentially people who have some kind of liberal moral position. And invariably they come down to, well, you know, I'm a Christian and I believe that the Bible or Jesus is saying that such and such a thing is okay some moral issue is okay, do divorce, marriage, do not judge, whatever, no. I'm doing that. And I say, okay, so when you became a Christian, what in your moral outlook changed? There must have been something that changed when you became a Christian or you didn't really become anything. Th there must be a point when you said prior to being a Christian, you were like, I'm okay with, you know, to use Nicky Gumbel's phrase, this bad stuff. And after I become a Christian, this bad stuff I'm not okay with. And invariably people are kind of like, oh, oh, yeah, now I see. And that's the construct that they're doing here. Private interpretation leads inevitably to support for your own uh, personal views. When you said that, though, that actually rang true with me. With the Alpha program, it allows you to become a Christian Without, without a change, without, any without change. sacrifice, yep. without giving up anything. You can just plug in whoever you are to this nebulous yep. Christianity, and you're okay. Yes. I don't have to hurt. Because, that, as Nikki no, Gumbel no said, 
uh, on the very I think it was the very first uh, clip we had of Nikki uh, when on the, on Tuesday he said guilt is feeling bad about something you have done not guilt is having done something wrong guilt is feeling bad so if you don't feel bad you ain't guilty but that's the that's the sociological and psychological jargon for the last 50 years so it's just pop psychology yeah. with a little veneer of Christianity technology. there's also another another heresy that I noted and I noted it just on your very final clip that you had there when he's talking about it being a crossword. Now, you think, oh, that's a good little analogy, you know. Yes, in Catholic tradition, you use more direct and simpler and more obvious passages to interpret more complicated passages. The problem is the moment you start talking about it as a crossword puzzle, something to be solved, something where there are clues and trickeries and there's, there's an answer but that answer is obfuscated. Welcome to Gnosticism, mm. which was actually the first heresy condemned by the church. Arguably Gnosticism is so early in the church as a heresy that the Gospel of John was written specifically to refute it. Gnosticism is this idea of secret knowledge, that you have some kind of knowledge that others don't, and that is how you are saved. And that's what is being pushed by Nicky Gumbel and his, and his merry band yeah. of, of performing and, fellows. And just addressing the Protestants out there of goodwill, of which there are many. There are many Protestants out there who sincerely are trying to seek the truth, whose lives did change when they had their conversion to the, the Christian faith, whatever. I mean, mine did. You know, I try to conform myself, myself more to the teachings of Christ and avoid serious sin and things like that. You know, the good news for those out there seeking truth is that there is an objective magisterium. You know, you don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to struggle on your own to try to understand these difficult passages or try to figure out, is this a sin? Is this not a sin? Who can tell me if this is a sin? You don't have to struggle with that because we have an objective magisterium. That was, like I said, officially given authority by Jesus to speak in his name. And, and you know, you can rest in that. Well, we got one priest out there actually is, uh, saying that this is an okay program, right? That's, that's the surprising thing is because yeah. you have a lot of, I mean, you have some decent bishops out there and cardinals and even some good priests who are pushing alpha, which I don't understand. For instance, Father Mike Schmitz, he's very popular. On, on videos online, and he's a good priest. You know, he doesn't say anything bad. But Boise, he's the guy who does the uh, the, the very well-known Father Mike series yeah, from Ascension yeah. Presents. Yeah, he's very very good-looking yeah. guy. I'm gesturing myself to say good-looking, not sure. <laughs> but, yeah. but his the, face better than mine. Diocese of Boise, Idaho, features a comment that he made, where he says, "Quote: Alpha is one of the best things happening in the church today." And unfortunately, because his material is good elsewhere, people are going to take that and say, "Oh, well, see, he's a good priest. He's pushing it." But Alpha is bad. It's very bad. It's one of the worst things happening in the church today. Well, some of the things that the, the Archdiocese sent out in, their, in material we have on the table here is they're saying, well, don't clear up difficulties and conundrums. It's not about that. So we're really not teaching the truth. We're teaching yeah. error, heresy that has to be undone. But even if there wasn't any heresy there, you're still not teaching the truth. And Paul VI, who actually defined evangelization in 1975 encyclical, said that it's not separate from catechesis. It is not separate from catechesis. If you separate those things out, then you're not doing evangelization. And how are you going to talk about something without ever bringing up the truth of Christ? You know, I'd like you to convert to a church, but I'm not going to tell you anything about it. And it was started by someone who I'm not going to tell you anything about, and on and on. How vague do you want to go before you say, well, I don't want to catechize anybody or get anything deep? Uh, this, this, this artificial distinction between apologetics, evangelization, and catechesis has got to be got rid of. I think it's one of the most pernicious errors of the modern era because what it is doing is people saying, well, I got to evangelize, and they've got this emotional froth. And then it's like, you know, they're not getting into anything deeper because they say, well, I don't want to catechize. They're all the same thing. It's just looked at from slightly different angles. Right. You're teaching people about Jesus. That's it. And yes, you don't have to teach people you know, from A to Z about Jesus, but every single letter that you teach must be true yes, and complete. Yes, absolutely. At a minimum, yes. I mean, when you evangelize, don't present error. Yeah, don't present know? error, remember, yeah. which is what <laughs> Alpha is absolutely doing. Even by yeah. Anglican standards, that is yeah. presenting error. He stood up, Nicky Gumbel stood up in an Anglican church, and he said something that uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury would ha haul him up on a heresy charge if the Archbishop of Canterbury still had a spine. Well, like I mentioned, that is awful. Yeah, like I mentioned yesterday, the Anglican, the, first the Anglicans were, were the first critics of Alpha. Yeah. And so. good on them. And to be fair, they, they should have the crushed Anglican, it when they had the chance. Nicky Gumbel told the Anglican, well, the Catholics are using it, therefore it must be okay. Well, the so Catholics right. and Salvation Army are using it, and so that's so. it's so broad that everybody can use it. And isn't that great? No, yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's not. So. <laughs> Well, we're out of time today, but please take a moment to ask our Blessed Mother on this her feast, the Immaculate Conception. 
to end the chaos in the church, starting with the Alpha program. On behalf of all of us here at Church Militant, we'd like to wish you a very blessed feast, the Immaculate Conception. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you Monday on the download. God love you.